pitting a lot of the optimism in equity performance is this idea that we're going to get gangbusters growth in tandem with relatively low benchmark borrowing costs for the United States. At what point do higher rates pose a problem to your thesis? Lisa, it's a great question. It's the number one question we get from every client, which is about the relationship between rates and equities. So I think you want to think about it two ways, both level and speed. And level not concerned about that right now. We've had a 50 basis point backup in nominal rates led by a backup in real yields, as you know. And so that still leaves equities undervalued in the context of very low uh, absolute level of rates. So one and a half percent round numbers. You could go to 2 percent, 2 percent on a 10 year Treasury yield. Same multiple today. Lisa, you'd only be back at the long-term average relative valuation of equities versus bonds. Mm. That's if you went to 2%. Not our forecast, but that gives you a sense of the, of the, if you will, the flexibility or the capacity of rates to continue to go higher and equity prices still to, uh, to, to be in a good position. On the other hand, the speed of the backup is something we are a little concerned about. And you saw in the last month, bond yields go up by a very significant amount, more than two standard deviation move. Put that you know in context. Very unusual in terms yeah. of the swiftness and the magnitude of the backup, and so that usually is associated with some headwind to the equity performance. And I think that's why duration is the way to think about it. You want to have shorter duration equities. This goes back to Jonathan's question a minute ago, which is how does it cyclicals do better? They have shorter duration in terms of their cash flows than the longer duration technology stocks. So I think that's the way okay. to approach equities to the lens of fixed income. So I'm going to rip up the script here, David Costin, and go, I thank you for the two standard deviation view on fixed income. We certainly lived that, including last Thursday. If short duration is cyclicals, does that mean Apple and Amazon and the rest of them are long duration and to be avoided? Well, they're longer durations, no question about that, uh, in terms of expectations and the faster growth. Uh, they don't, shouldn't be avoided. I would think of it as the barbell strategy. So they're a core part of the portfolio. The tech, and the tech sector in particular is a, is a key driver. The semiconductors are expected to have a 28% higher level of profits in 2020. Okay. Oh, David, look, just because of time. David, I don't mean to interrupt, but just because of time, this is so, so, so important. If they have that cash level and we get a 6%, 7%, whatever GDP bubble, is it just going to be one big share buyback like we saw from Intel over at a decade? We're going to see, we are already seen this year, we're two months into the year, we've had near record levels of authorizations by boards to uh, approve and, and authorize uh, share repurchases for this year. And so that's a reflection of management looking at their business for this year, better cash flows, more flexibility on how to spend money. That's one uh, you know, <clears throat> use of that cash is to, is to buy back shares. That will be a supporting mechanism, in my opinion. But the biggest source of cash is individuals. Tom, you've had about a $500 billion diminution, reduction in money market mutual fund assets uh, you know, in the last several months, a lot of that money at a zero rate is going into equities. And of course, a lot of it's going to the SPAC market. You've had 175 SPACs this year alone, $56 billion. We're on pace to exceed last year's record level by the end of this month. Are you, are you going to do a SPAC with Jan Hatzius? Is that what we're looking forward to? <laughs> I'll have to, uh, I'll have to, uh, have to go ask him about that.